Occupational English test, listening test. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions one to twenty-four, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract one. Extract one, questions one to twelve. Ivy Simons. In this part of the test, you will hear Dr. Jonathan Wilson interviewing Ivy Simons, an elderly patient. For questions one to twelve, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, Mrs. Simons. Thanks for coming in today. Oh, uh, I just wondered, Doctor. I got this letter from your receptionist. I think it was. I was wondering what to do with it, but it says I should come in for a routine six-month checkup. But I think I was only here a few weeks ago, wasn't I? Uh, let's see now. It's、uh, October twenty-eighth today, so it's just over six months since your last visit. Really? It actually was in March. Oh my! Time flies. I thought it was only a few weeks ago. Yes, time certainly does fly. That's right. Now tell me how you've been for the last six months. How have you been going? Oh,、uh, I think it's just the same as.、Um, oh no! I did have flu actually. M- my son, you know,、uh, he lives in the city, and he came to help me. He's my only son. That's Tom. Okay, and and was the flu, was it a bad flu? I don't think I saw you. Oh, I I, I think it was all right. I got better anyway. Okay, good. And yeah, I do know Tom. We were in school together, and he did come with you on the last visit in March. Oh yes, now I remember. He does know you, doesn't he? That's right, he does. Well, anyway, he came to help me, but I'm fine now. Well, that's good. Well, look. Let's just check out a few things, shall we? Could you just step on the scales for me, please? Oh, I don't think I've put on any weight. I've never been fat. No, you certainly haven't put on weight. In fact, looking at this measurement, you've lost over four kilograms. But we'll talk a bit about that later. I'd just like to check your blood pressure. Oh, well, that should be okay. Yeah, it's not too bad. It is a bit higher than last time, though. Now. Ivy, does the、uh, Webster pack the pharmacist has made up for you? Does that help you make sure that you take the right medications every morning?、Uh, what medications do you mean? It should have your Carvia for controlling blood pressure, and the Oroxine tablets to ensure that your thyroid is functioning adequately, and then there's the Lipex to keep your cholesterol levels under control. Oh yes,、uh, my chemist has been very good to me. He he keeps track of all my prescriptions and sets everything out for me, so I I know what to take each day. Of course, sometimes I notice I seem to have missed a day here and there. But one thing I always take is my vitamin C and my vitamin E. I've taken them for years, and they're very good for me. 
Well, I'm pleased that that's working for you, and it is very important that you take your Cavia, Oroxene, and your Lipex as well. So perhaps if you leave the Webster pack in a place where you'll always see it when you wake up in the morning. Well, Ivy, can you tell me more about how you're managing on your own on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, I'm managing myself, I think, uh, but I am having a few problems. So, I mean, uh, you know, Tom got a gardener for me to help out with the garden. Well, that must be a help for you, actually. Oh, I don't know about that. Uh, quite frankly, Tom seems to think he's okay, but I don't know what he's doing. I think he's stealing my tools. Hmm, that's rather unusual. What makes you think that? Well, several things have gone missing, like my garden gloves uh, and my digging fork, which I use for putting flowers in, and my watering can as well. So that's why I'd like to get rid of it. Do you have any help with the housework? Oh, I can manage that. Oh, yes. Uh, um, well, um, uh, I've got a home help lady that helps. Some help people came round and they said I could have help with cleaning the house. But I don't think these people are really trustworthy. Now, you take this morning. I wanted a cup of tea. I always use my favourite teacup, and this morning it was gone. Now, the cleaning lady was there yesterday, and she must have taken it. And I also think she's hidden the remote control for the TV. Hmm. Yeah, as I said, it doesn't seem normal that people would do this. No. Do you think that maybe you might have misplaced these things, perhaps? Oh, I always put things in the same place, and I've been doing that for years. I see. Well, maybe this is something you should talk to Tom about if it's worrying you. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. Yes. You will hear Dr. Jane Hope interviewing Henry Bunyan, a patient with a recent... For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Come on in, Henry. How are you this morning? Not too bad, thanks, Doctor, and yourself? Oh, well, busy as usual. Yeah, I can see that. There are a lot of customers in the waiting room. Yeah. There was a nice spot of rain we got last night. Yes, it certainly saved water in the garden, and that was a bonus. So, Henry, have you come for your blood test results? Yeah, that's right. Give us the news, Doctor. Well, it's not bad news, but your total cholesterol was 6.6. .6. Your triglycerides 1.6 and your HDL was 1.54 and the LDL was 4.65. So what does that all mean, Doctor? Well, you remember we did the same test a year ago? Yeah. So what these current results show now is that compared with last year's results, there has been a sharp rise in your LDL level. Yes, well, what's brought this about? Well, as we discussed last year, Cholesterol is carried in the blood by different types of protein carriers called lipoproteins. Yeah, I remember that. Well, the two which carry the most cholesterol are the low-density lipoproteins, LDLs, which we believe promote atherosclerosis, or thickening of the arteries, while high-density lipoproteins, HDLs, tend to prevent this. In your case, unfortunately, your LDL has increased and there are a number of factors that may have contributed to the rise in your LDL. For instance, a higher fat content in your diet, right. increase in stress, mm -hmm. maybe you're not exercising as much as you were. I guess I'm not. Mm, that's right. 
Have you noticed any discomfort or had any general health issues that have caused you concern lately? No, not really. Okay, now Henry, um, I know your family history and that your dad died of a stroke at 60. I just want to ask you a few questions about what you're doing now. Sure. What about your current diet? Are you eating much fatty food? Yeah, I guess so. I, mean, I, I do enjoy McDonald's at lunchtime and um, eat quite a bit of meat. I'm not really a big fan of vegetables. Mm, yeah. Have you noticed any change in weight? Um, do you think you've gained a little? Well, since I last saw you, I've probably put on about five kilograms. Mm, yeah, well, <laughs> that's quite substantial. Um, what about exercise? Do you still manage to do that regularly? I remember last time you told me that you were taking your dog for a run once or twice a week and, and that you swim regularly. Well, actually, in the last year I've been pretty busy at work and I've had a lot of family commitments lately, so I probably exercise a bit less. Mm. And are you still smoking? Yes, I am. I'm, I've tried to cut down, though. I'm probably smoking five or ten cigarettes a day. Mm, okay. And how about alcohol? How many alcoholic drinks do you have in a week? Well, in a week, I, I, well, I probably have two or three a day, so I don't know if you multiply that. You know, I, I guess it adds up to quite a few, 16 or more maybe. Mm, mm. And um, would you say that you drink more at the weekend? Yeah, yeah, a little bit more on the weekend. We have a glass of wine as well at night sometimes. Mm, mm. Right. Okay, well, um, what about your work? Is it any more stressful? It is, actually. Since that economic downturn, we've all been putting in longer hours, trying to drum up a bit more business, so I guess mm. it is a bit of a stressful time. Okay. Well, judging by what you've said, I'd say there are a number of things that certainly could be impacting on your health. Now, Henry, um, based on what you've told me, you do have some risk factors, and I'd like to talk to you about ways we can minimise these, if that's okay? Sure, Doctor. So, the best way to maximise healthy levels of your cholesterol is through diet, of course, and taking account of the things that uh, you need to avoid. Yeah, I see. So, let's talk about some simple dietary measures. Firstly, of course, you should try to avoid fatty meats and processed meats like salami, sausages. Okay. Uh, also, you need to cut down on snack food, uh, such as chips, hamburgers, all those little things you probably love. Yeah. And uh, takeaway food, of course, especially deep fried food. I don't know whether you have a lot of takeaways. Well, I do, so you mean no more McDonald's, Doctor? <laughs> That's right. It certainly would be better to avoid it. Just try it grilled instead. Okay. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You will hear a lecture based on the subject of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Now read the question. What are the symptoms of ADHD? Most kids could be described at some point as inattentive, impulsive or hyperactive. Explanations for this behaviour vary widely, ranging from the child being overtired to overexcited. However, when such behaviour lasts for significant periods of time and when it interferes with, with life at school and at home, the explanation may be due to a condition such as Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD. 
Some studies suggest that about 2% of primary school age children have ADHD, while others have suggested that almost 18% have ADHD. However, the majority of researchers put the figure at between 5% and 10%. Question 26. In test, you will hear a talk based on an essay published by the Public Library of Open Science on the topic of seasonal hunger. Now read the question. Most of the world's acute hunger and undernutrition occurs not in conflicts and natural disasters, but in the annual hunger season. This is a time of year that is characterised by a lack of stored food from last year's harvest, high food prices and lack of jobs. Nearly 7 out of 10 hungry people in the world, or about 600 million in total, are either landless rural labourers or members of small farm households. Many of these 600 million people live in areas where water or temperature constraints allow only one crop harvest per year. Question 27. Part of the test, you will hear a lecture based on the subject of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Now read the question. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, is a growing global epidemic that is significant in both developed and developing countries. Morbidity and mortality from COPD will rise as populations age. Furthermore, as the mortality from cardiovascular and infectious diseases falls, the occurrence of COPD will become more common in society. This is supported by the current trend, which indicates that more people are dying from COPD each year. In addition, COPD is associated with several other diseases, such as osteoporosis, diabetes, glaucoma, and sleep disorders. Question 28. Dr. Brian Fleming interviewing a parent of a child presenting today. Now read the question. Come in, Mr Murray. I see you've got Kate with you. Yes, that's right, Doctor. She's had an accident at school. Oh, dear. Well... I'll bring you both in here and get Kate comfortable on the couch first. Oh, good. I think she's in quite a bit of pain. Yes, obviously, and she's looking very pale. Now, can you tell me what happened? Well, she had a fall at school, actually. It was in her gymnastics class, and, I don't know, I think she landed awkwardly in one of the practice exercises. And how long ago was that? Well, the school called me to pick her up, and I came straight here, so... About an hour ago, I think. Question 29. Dr. Tamara Kayali Brown is a bioethicist at Deakin University. She specialises in the ethics and philosophy of mental illness. Now read the question. I asked for women who had been diagnosed with major depression or bipolar disorder. 
because I wanted a variety of different types of depression and women who had gone through treatment and were feeling better. I only wanted women, though, because gender issues in depression had already been studied quite a bit, and I wanted to focus on experiences of depression. So rather than including different genders and comparing them, I just wanted one gender. And it made sense for me to focus on women because, first of all, there are more women diagnosed with depression than men. And secondly, I'm a woman, and there is some evidence out there that there are more open conversations that happen between people of the same gender. So it made sense for me to ask for women. Question 30. You hear us. Emily Johnson is a neurologist at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore, and I spoke to her earlier. Now read the question. We're like, I think most people are surprised to hear that. We often think of epilepsy as being a childhood disease, and it is common in children. Then the incidence kind of tapers off in adulthood and at midlife. But then by the 60s, and especially by the 70s and 80s, the incidence of new cases of epilepsy is actually higher than it is in children. So a lot of people are surprised to hear this. What kind of epilepsy is it? Is it? Because there's various kinds of epilepsy. You can get major seizures, you can get what's called petit mal or absence, behavioral things that happen. Is it stock standard epilepsy where you drop down and convulse? Great question. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be, although that can certainly happen. But then the other type is called focal epilepsy. And that is the type that starts in one part of the brain and then can spread to other parts. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, Choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract one. Extract one. Questions 31 to 36. You will hear a lecture based on the subject of asbestos. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Asbestos is a naturally occurring mineral rock that was mined in Australia from the 1940s to late 1980s and used in a variety of materials and products. Unlike other rocks made up of small particles, 
Asbestos is made up of fibres so thin that they can be invisible to the unaided eye. If asbestos materials or products are disturbed, these fibres can be released into the air and remain for extended periods of time, where they can be inhaled to the deepest parts of the lungs. Asbestos is a group of naturally occurring silicate minerals that are made up of fine fibrous crystals. Three of these are chrysidolite, blue asbestos, amosite, brown asbestos, and chrysotile, white asbestos. Asbestos was a desired resource for many companies because it is also relatively cheap to mine and process. Unfortunately, however, Asbestos is also a highly toxic, insidious and environmentally persistent material that has killed thousands of Australians and will kill thousands more this century. Australia and the UK have the highest rates of asbestos-related death in the world. This is understood to be because of the amount of asbestos used in these countries and the relatively high proportion used in the, of the most dangerous types, brown and blue. Asbestos was considered a valuable product due to its resistance to fire, moisture, chemicals and heat, and also its suitability as an insulation material. However, due to such devastating diseases in people, a national ban on asbestos came into effect on the 31st of December 2003. People may be exposed to asbestos in their workplace, their communities or in their homes. If products containing asbestos are disturbed, tiny asbestos fibres are released into the air. When asbestos fibres are breathed in, they may get trapped in the lungs and remain there for a long time. Over time, these fibres can accumulate and cause scarring and inflammation. As a result, breathing can be affected which leads to a serious health problem. Research has shown that there are several factors which can help to determine how asbestos exposure affects an individual, including dose, which means how much asbestos an individual was exposed to, duration, how long an individual was exposed, size, shape and chemical makeup of the asbestos fibres, source of the exposure, and individual risk factors, such as smoking and pre-existing lung disease. The inhalation of asbestos fibres may lead to a number of respiratory diseases including lung cancer, asbestosis, pleural plaques, benign pleural effusion and malignant mesothelioma. Although exposure is now strictly regulated, patients continue to present with these diseases because of the long interval between exposure to asbestos and the clinical appearance of disease. Presenting signs and symptoms tend to be non-specific. Thus, the occupational history helps guide clinical suspicion. People particularly at risk are those who have worked in the mining of asbestos, especially blue asbestos. Other at-risk jobs include shipbuilders, insulation workers, fitters, carpenters and electricians. Immediate family members of workers are also at risk due to washing clothes which may have been contaminated with asbestos fibres, even though the amount of exposure is very small. Because exposure to cigarette smoke increases the risk of developing lung cancer in patients with a history of asbestos exposure, smoking cessation is essential. Patients with asbestosis or lung cancer should also receive influenza and pneumococcal vaccinations. The three most common asbestos-related lung diseases are asbestosis, lung cancer, mesothelioma, and I will now outline their symptoms, prevalence and treatment based on a recent US study. Asbestosis. Firstly, people with asbestosis have symptoms such as difficulty in breathing and dry cough and it affects approximately 200,000 patients with 2,000 deaths annually.
Now look at extract 2. Extract 2, questions 37 to 42. In this part of the test, you will hear a lecture based on the subject of anaphylaxis. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Anaphylaxis is a serious, rapid-onset allergic reaction that can result in death. Severe anaphylaxis affects the whole body and is characterised by life-threatening upper airway obstruction, breathing difficulties, rash, oedema and in some cases hypertension leading to shock. Anaphylaxis in children is most often caused by food and breathing difficulties is a common symptom. Importantly, there is usually a background of hypersensitivity reactions such as hay fever, eczema or asthma. Anaphylaxis is a medical emergency where immediate treatment is needed to prevent potential death. When exposed to a foreign substance, some people suffer reactions identical to anaphylaxis, but in which no allergy is involved. These reactions are called anaphylactoid, which means anaphylaxis-like reactions. In anaphylaxis, the immune system must be primed by previous allergen exposure. On the other hand, anaphylactoid reactions can occur with no previous allergen exposure at all. An example of something that can bring on an anaphylactoid type of severe reaction is radiographic contrast material the dye injected into arteries and veins to make them show up on an X-ray. Although the mechanism of an anaphylactoid reaction is different, the allergy treatment is the same. I will now introduce some statistics on anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis occurs infrequently. However, it is life-threatening and can occur at any time. Milder forms of anaphylaxis occur much more frequently than fatal anaphylaxis. An Australian survey of parent reported allergy and anaphylaxis found that 1 in 170 school children had suffered at least one episode of anaphylaxis. Another Australian study showed that in areas where native Myrmesia ant species are prevalent, one in 50 adults have experienced anaphylaxis after stings from the native Myrmosia species or honeybees. However, deaths from anaphylaxis are uncommon and estimated to occur at a rate of one per three million population per year. In areas where sting allergy is common, the death rate may be higher than this. 
Hospital-based studies suggest a death rate in the order of 1 per 100 to 200 episodes of anaphylaxis treated in an emergency department. There is some evidence that the incidence of food allergy and anaphylaxis, like that of allergic rhinitis and atopic dermatitis, may be increasing. The likelihood of an individual having anaphylaxis is influenced by the following points. Age, gender, atopy, the genetic tendency to develop classic allergic diseases, source of exposure, prior history of any type of allergic reaction. After an initial exposure to a substance like bee sting toxin, the person's immune system becomes sensitised to that allergen. On a subsequent exposure, an allergic reaction occurs. Severe allergic reactions are usually triggered by a limited number of allergic exposures. These include injection, swallowing, inhaling or skin contact with an allergen by a severely allergic individual. Examples of injected allergens are bee, hornet, wasp and yellow jacket stings and certain vaccines which have been prepared on an egg medium and allergen extracts used for diagnosis and treatment of allergic conditions. Antibiotics such as penicillin can trigger a reaction by injection or swallowing. Typically, a severe reaction caused by a food allergy occurs after eating that particular food, even a small bite. Allergy to peanuts is an example here. Skin contact with the food rarely causes anaphylaxis. Foods most commonly associated with anaphylaxis are peanuts, seafood, nuts and, in children particularly, eggs and cow's milk. A severe allergic reaction from an inhaled allergen is rare. An increasingly recognisable example is when an allergic individual inhales particles from rubber gloves or other latex products. In emergency department studies, food allergy is the commonest cause in children, responsible for about 80% of anaphylactic reactions in which the cause has been identified. Whereas in adults, foods are implicated in only 20 to 30% of cases. That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test.